I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, uh, Lynn Wardock, and she will be speaking on introducing busy moms and busy kids, and she is from St. Mary Visiting Catholic Church in Taylor, Pennsylvania. A former homeschooling mom of five, Lynn has served as a catechist in the Ruthenian Eparchy of Passaic for over 30 years. She shares the practical nuances of Eastern Christian family life through the features of her blog and website, busymom.com, and is the author of The Jesse Tree, The Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus Tree, and The Busy Mom's Guide to Great Fast Meals. She is also the creator and executive editor of Busy Kids Magazine, and is an oblate and coordinator of the Mirbury Lay Sisters of St. John the Beloved at Holy Annunciation Visiting Catholic Monastery in Sugarville, Pennsylvania. Thank you so very much. As you know, um, my name is Lynn Wardock. I'm from northeastern Pennsylvania. I'm a mom of five kids. Um, I'm married to my husband, Paul, for about 30 years now. And we have a sweet little two-year-old granddaughter named Sophia and a little tiny baby grandson that we're expecting to make his appearance sometime after pasta. So I'm a family person. Is this is this on? Yes. Perhaps we can move closer. Is it better? Awesome. Okay. So I must say I was surprised and a little intimidated when um, Father Ed asked me to address the assembly this year. Um, I didn't know what to say because you, I, I always thought of myself as being a very grassroots kind of inconspicuous person. Then I'm realizing that there are people that actually do read what I put up there. And it was, it was very humbling, but very happy for me to find that out. Um, having met most of you over the past two days, I have to admit I'm a little less nervous than I would have been otherwise. So I thank you all for your kindness. Um, like most of you, I grew up in service to the church. That's my parents' fault. <laughs> my dad's a cantor nearly all my life. I think I he started when I was around seven. So I've always known what it's like to be in service to the church. My mom took her faith very seriously. Um, in fact, I told some people before that my dad actually missed my graduation because he had a funeral. So that's kind of how it goes. You know, when you're in service to the church, priorities come first. Um, recently, my family, all 12 of us, my mom, my dad, my husband, myself, my kids, my grandkids, all changed churches and we moved to a nice, small, rural kind of mission parish. And it reminds me so much of the mission parish I grew up in. Now, before I tell you about Busy Mom and Busy Kids, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what that was like for me growing up in the faith. And it was, you're going to understand later why this is so important to me today. Um, that mission parish that I grew up in is now a bank. They closed it. Every time I drive past it, I have to admit I still make the sign of the cross because I know he's there somewhere. That's where I first met him, and that's where I first fell in love with him. And it will always be a special place to me, no matter what it is. I had very fond memories of growing up there. I remember my mom writing us notes as kids to get off the school bus at my friend Mary Ann's house because Mary Ann lived just down the street. And her dad would pick us up in the truck and he would drive us to the church where we would meet our moms doing whatever they were doing to serve the church. Um, whether it was pinching pierogi or making paluki or making soup for the slant and soup sale, um, the Christmas bazaar, the we used to make crafts, picking weeds in the flower beds, and anything that needed to be done, these families in the church did it. And they did it together and they did it happily. Um, the, when I was in my late teens then, we moved from that church. <coughs> And my dad was asked to canter at a larger church in a bigger city. So we transferred there, there, there then as a family, and we found that it was an enormous and beautiful building with tons of parishioners, not at all like that little center block parish that I was used to with the folding doors so that we could have the hall and the church all in one place. This was a beautiful building. It was huge. We were a little intimidated to go there for the first Sunday. Um, but growing up as a daughter of a cantor, I was so very used to singing along with my dad. He would call us in, I would be doing dishes, and have dishwater up to my elbows, a plate in one hand and a towel in the other, and he'd say, come by the piano now and sing this part. <laughs> because I'm writing this new arrangement for the cherubic hymn, and I want to hear it before I take it to choir practice. So, soprano, tenor, bass, alto, here we go. And we would have to sing it for him. So we sang with him everywhere he went. So when we got to this new church on the very first Sunday, it was packed. There were people wall to wall, shoulder to shoulder in every pew. And the liturgy began, and my father sang, 
And we all built it out in similar fashion, and we realized that no one else was doing that. <laughs> we were it. So I turned to my mom and I said, what do we do? She said, keep going. So we did. And so we sang along with my dad that entire liturgy, and no one else was with us. So, you know, I learned very early that vapor's not always better. You know, it's like, it, it's so sad. It's like the whitewashed sepulcher, you know, like it was beautiful on the outside, inviting us all could be, but then dead on the inside. There was no life there. They didn't have any kind, any kind of social after church. No one, no one greeted us. No one said hello. There was no cake. I was mad. I was mad. I mean, I was 17 at the time, I think. So a little while later, we got a new parish priest. And much to our surprise and happiness and joy, he decided he was just as appalled as we were. And he wanted to see some changes made in that church. So the first thing he did was start a catechism program for all of the children. Now, there were over 100 children in that program. And they had never had catechism before. <laughs> Very sad situation. So he put an ad in the bulletin and he asked for volunteers from the congregation to help teach. Being a teenager at that time, of course, that wasn't what I wanted. Well, wait till you're asking if you're a teenager. But um, no one replied. So they got two nuns to come from the Brazilian Sisters in Wilkesbury to teach those hundred children. And they said, we need something. We can't possibly do this on our own. And my dad, in his usual fashion, says, my daughter's will help. <laughs> <laughs> so I was drafted. And you know, I fell in love with it after that. That was something I, I teaching them, I, it just went on from there. I think I've taught every grade level there is. I've used every curriculum I could find. I even spent two years at LaSalle Academy in Jessup when they first opened. It was a merger between a Byzantine Catholic school and two Roman Catholic schools that were right there. And so they needed somebody to teach the Roman kids what Byzantine Catholicism was all about, and they needed somebody to teach the Byzantine kids their stuff. So I was hired to do that for two years before um, I had to head in the area because I had another job. I'm actually a medical technologist by trade. I'm not, a, I'm not a teacher and I'm not a theologian, but I ended up doing all this work. Don't ask me why God is good. But at any rate, um, I had to move for a job and I had to leave that, but I love teaching, and that's what I found out from being drafted at that early age, is that that's where my heart was. And so, um, I lost my place. I got so carried away, I don't remember where my notes are. Um, it got to the point, there were 100 kids in the program when we started, and it dwindled down a little bit. It's, you know, you notice different parishes are the same. Um, it dwindled and dwindled and dwindled until finally, my own five kids, my godson and one other kid, were the only ones in the program. And this was maybe 10, 15 years ago, and we haven't had a program in our parish since. And that's that's one of the reasons we moved to another another church, is because I have a granddaughter now, and assumed to have a grandson. They need some sense of schooling in their faith that comes from somebody besides mom and grandma. You need a community of people. So we decided that was going to be what we were going to do. My husband and I, when this happened, we went from church to church. And I know people don't like church hoppers, but you know what, when your kids are on the line, you do what you have to do? And we went, and we checked out. And there in, I live in Northeast Pennsylvania, and there are Byzantine churches, we have a Ruthenian, Melkite, um, Ukrainian, they're everywhere. So we went to at least a dozen, maybe more, Eastern Catholic churches to find the community we wanted. We wanted a place where our kids could grow. We wanted a place where they had community, where they were friendly, where they were a, a chance for an education program. And sadly, we didn't find any place that fit all those points. Finally, we ended up at this mission parish, which because they, they don't have children in that parish at all, they just don't, but they're friendly people, and they're kind, and they're good, and they, they were welcoming to us, and then we, we decided to, and it's very close to our home, so we decided to land there. And we're really happy that we did. So as I said, I love to teach young people about the love of Jesus and the richness of our Byzantine Catholic faith, and I homeschooled all of our children through high school. And when we had to take them, there was no program. I had to teach them the usual reading, writing, arithmetic, and we just added religion to that as well, and I educated the kids at home. But over the years, I developed a lot of different methods to awaken the senses of my children. I found that those senses that were sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit at their chrismation were the best way to introduce God to them. If you could take those Spiritual lessons, like, for instance, like the scent of Easter Pascha lilies at the church, it, it ties you. When you smell those things, you come right back to that place where you first smelled them, where you first tasted them, where you first felt them, where you first learned about them. And they create sensory memories in your head that can be triggered 
even years later as an adult, and it brings you right back to that moment. So using that idea, that intentional coupling of sensory experiences with experiences of stories like saint lessons or scripture lessons, they, they plant those experiences firmly in a child's memory, and they're just waiting to be triggered, even longed for, and then called forth at the slightest suggestion. Now these are the memories that I believe can call adults back to the church. And for this reason, I believe that experiences like that should be cultivated by churches and families at all costs, no matter what. Is that better? I can stand a little closer to you. Yeah, stand closer. I will. And if you can't hear, just wave and I'll, I'll try harder. Okay, so when you think about it, these sensory connections are nothing new. They've been historically celebrated according to the customs and traditions of our rich cultural heritage. And I allude to this in an essay that I once wrote called Mourning the Loss of Wax Stained Easter Shoes. It's on my, my website. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it, but it's one of the things that I wrote that I just poured my entire heart into one night. Um, I penned this one great Holy Saturday after attending services where I was really disappointed to discover that somehow our parish made the sad decision to abandon the practice of some of these beautiful, meaningful, sensory traditions just when my children needed them the most. In my heartbroken state, I poured out my disappointment in this open letter to my children, and I'm going to read a small portion of it to you so you can understand why my soul became so distraught. Now, to set the stage, I spent about half an hour talking to my littlest children at the time, who were still in grade school, about what they were going to see at Easter vigil, and like the, the Saturday night um, vigil and then matins, so that they would understand what it was they were looking at. Afterwards, I wrote, the words I shared with you before church came from the many memories of services like these speckled throughout my own childhood, complete with wax-stained Easter shoes, the intoxicating aroma of incense mingled with the scent of flowers at the tomb, intricate melodies chanted of chanted hymns that were sung only at these services, and sore knees from crawling on them to venerate the plush Janitza. Sadly, however, what you actually observed tonight at the services was quite different. I told you, my child, about the candle you would hold to light the way as we walked with the myrrh bearers to find Jesus in the tomb. Each of us would pass the flame along to others as we shared the light from Father's candle, light from light. That's how I got the wax all over my new Easter shoes when I was just a little girl like you. It appears that you won't have to worry about that tonight because there are no candles for us. They say it's too windy tonight. I told you, my child, to wear your comfortable shoes because we would walk in a solemn procession around the church along with the myrrh bearers to find the body of Christ in his tomb. Well, to find the body not in his tomb. All the neighbors and passers-by would witness our faith when they see us, so I told you, you must be well-behaved when you walk along. Well, it seems you won't have to worry about that either. We're only processing up to the vestibule tonight. Perhaps they decided it's too far or too cold, maybe not important. I told you, my child, that Father would knock loudly on the doors of the church to signify the rolling back of the stone from Christ's tomb. I'm sorry you didn't get to hear him do that. We chanted the Traparian I taught you. That was nice. When I was a little girl, we had the most beautiful choir. How I wish I could have heard, you could have heard them sing it back then. I used to wait all year to chant my favorite Paschal hymns with them, but most of them are gone to be with the Lord now, and nobody has time for prior practice on Tuesday nights anymore anyway. The lights were all on, I know, and the church was decorated before we left to follow the myrrh bearers. Nobody offered to be the ones left behind to set the stage for us, so Father had to set it all up by himself before he vested for Vespers. Not much of a difference when we came back in, and I'm sorry we didn't get to walk under the plush Janitza as we expected to do. Perhaps there weren't enough men to hold it up for us. Maybe next year. So I write about so many of these kinds of sensory traditions in my lessons. I was fortunate to have attended that small mission parish as a young girl where all these things were held in the highest esteem. I was at an age then where I could solidify them all in my memory by experiencing all the sounds and sights and smells, flavors, textures of them, and they connected to feelings and understandings that brought my soul closer to God. How sad it is that we're so quickly abandoned today, and so these sensory connections are, are, are no longer made to these, these feelings, these uh, uh, ideas, these, these longing things in their minds. They, the children don't even know that they exist. People ask, why don't your children want these things anymore? And I say, how, how, why, how could they? They don't even know them. They've never seen them. So when I had to stop teaching, rather than store those precious lessons away with the dust and the mothballs, I started to gather my lessons together and write them down so I could continue to use them to educate my own children. 
I started to share them with some of my interested friends on the internet who were also home educating their children in the faith and were as desperate to make those memories and sensory connections to the divine as I was. Soon they began to ask me if I had any good lesson plans to share with them or great ideas for specific feasts or gospel stories. I had a really great Pentecost windsock craft that would remind the children of the, the wind and the flames and it was bit, people that was very popular people asked for that all the time then there was the saint john's word miracle salve they love that one because you take these little yellow flowers that come out at the feast of saint john on the 24th of june and you put them in a jar with some olive oil and i tell the children to shake it every day and when they come back in a week or so the oil in the jar turns a brilliant red and that reminds them of the martyrdom now these are little everyday things and they might not sound like they're all that wonderful but to me they're treasures because my children learn those things and they, they want to go out every year and they see them things and they grow everywhere, these St. John's work flowers. They're cute little yellow flowers, but every time they see them now, they remember the martyrdom, they remember the oil, they remember how red it turned. And those connections are made for them. There's also a little pot pie recipe that I have for the story of the seven sleepers of Ephesus. Do you know that story? It's amazing, you have to look it up. So I contend that Washington Irving was familiar with this ancient tale when he wrote his story of Rick Van Winkle. It's a really great story. So we just commemorated them last week. I know because I made this pot pie with seven ingredients for the seven sleepers. And I tucked them into their pie shells and their little biscuit crusts and I put them in the oven for 250 years, just like the seven sleepers. And then I laugh and I tell the kids, no, it's only 45 minutes, but they remember the 250 years. Children love the story. And throughout their entire lives, every time somebody serves them a pot pie, they're going to count those vegetables to see if there are seven. And then they're going to remember the line from the creed that says, I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. They will know what that means because they eat my pot pie, and that means the world to me. Now, these are the kinds of activities that people began to ask me for. So it wasn't long before these friends told their friends, and then they would contact me, and they would say, oh, please send them to me as well. And I had an email list as long as my arm. And then I said, you know, this became a full-time job. People were asking me for so many things, I didn't have time to do anything else. So I said, okay, this is it. I'm going to put out a monthly newsletter. Give me all your email addresses. I'll put you on a list, and I'll send you everything I have for each month. And that's how this all started. And then, one day, a mom from my list replied to me. Now, she sent me something that I recognized as my own lesson plan, but it was adorable. It was all dolled up. It was glossy paper with pretty fonts and background pages and pictures that she had taken of her own children doing the things that I said. I couldn't believe it. It looked like a magazine. So I asked her what this was about, and she said, you know, I'm a graphic artist by trade. And I left the field to have my children, and I was bored one day, and I liked what you had down there, and I decided I was going to doll it all up. And I thought, wow, that was, it's beautiful. And she said, you know, I could do this every month for you. And I said, oh, I don't have any money to pay you. This is just something I do for fun. And she said, I don't need to be paid. She said, I want my kids to have engaging resources. This is fun for me. And so I had a partner. So then a little while later, another mom, a Ukrainian Catholic, came to me and she said she was tasked with coming up with material for her at Park Hill Newspaper The Way. And she said, I don't have anything to give them and I don't know what to do. Can I share some of your things with them? Sure, why not? I'm all about sharing, no problem. She said, well, in exchange, I will give you some of my hand-drawn coloring pages and you can put them in your newsletter. So now I had two pages to my newsletter and I had two partners. <laughs> So then another mom, a Melkite, came to me and she said, she used to be a reporter, and I kid you not, this could not be any better, this God is so good. She used to be a reporter for the Washington Times and she left the field to have her children. And she said, you know, things are coming up in my parish that I think your kids would like to read about. Would you mind if I did some interviews for you and then send you those to, to attach to your newsletter? Would I mind? <laughs> no, I said, you're hired. That You know I can't pay you. She said, no, 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 this is for fun. I said, okay, good. So now, and she said, she, of all things, she told me she wanted to be part of my fun new ministry. I was a ministry then. I didn't even know it. I was a ministry. So then our little newsletter is on its way to becoming a full-fledged digital magazine. And soon the editors of The Way requested that our materials be translated into Ukrainian. <laughs> I don't know Ukrainian. I didn't know anybody on my team who knew Ukraine, and I said, what are we going to do? So I had a social media presence at that time, because I would put things out you know, online for people to use as they saw fit. So I thought, I'm going to put out a little ad and see what happens. Well, a sweet, kind soul replied, 
She said she's a wife of a priest and she had come here from Ukraine and in Ukraine, she was a Ukrainian language teacher. She said to me, you know, Lynn, my, my English is pretty good, but my Ukrainian's impeccable. I said, well, then you're hired. <laughs> and she, every time, now the way is defunct now, they don't do it anymore, but every time we needed something translated, she would just do it. She just did it for them. And, and that, was, that was the best gift God could have sent us. So since then, we've welcomed many more volunteers to the Busy Kids team. They're all highly skilled and eager to add their talents to the ministry. And when we needed help writing content, I placed another Facebook ad and it was answered by an Orthodox mom who wanted to help us. Little did we know what she did for a living. Now we have a history professor from Western Kentucky University writing our history column called Meanwhile Back in Byzantium. So she tells the children all about Byzantine history using the theme of the month. It's phenomenal how God provides. So we have other clergy wives on our team who write songs, create puzzles, teach iconography lessons. We have an Orthodox priest who's an iconographer who's given us permission to use all of his icons in our publication for your royalty because he knows it's for the children. Um, up to this point, we offer the magazine as a strictly online digital publication, but then it was about a year later that people began asking us, can we please have this in print? And so we looked into different ways of doing it. It took us a while to find the route, but we finally did find the way to do it, and um, we now offer it as a, a print edition to be mailed to individual homes as well. Um, we found a way to contract with a printing company that was owned by a parishioner of another one of our clergy wives on the team without any real out-of-pocket expense to us. Um, we began to take orders from interested readers and we charged them only for the cost of printing and shipping. So we really don't make any money on this and any small amount that we might make at the end of the year, we gather together in November, which I have to do next week, and we send it off to um, Eastern Christian monasteries of our choice. Our team picks out which ones they want and we send them out as Christmas gifts to them. So um, at present, Busy Mom has approximately 1,300 website contacts. There are 2,700 Facebook followers. Um, we've enjoyed almost 200 paid subscribers at one time or another. Uh, we have 700 subscribed to receive our monthly digital educate, or edition by joining our mailing list. Um, we've also recently been approached by the God With Us ECF people to create a monthly newsletter for families called The Dwelling Place, and you might have seen it out there. It's gonna be phenomenal. We use the same format we use for busy kids, except that we teach the same uh, theme to every member of a family parish, no matter what their age or their, their spiritual level. We start at the most basic infant level with sensory bins and little tactile things that they could learn about, and we progress through and give each age level a, a different task, a different sensory experience, a different craft to do, until we get to 16 plus and adult where we have apologetics lessons and icon study. So we do a lot in that regard. Dwelling Place is gonna be something that, that is gonna really be a, a help to homeschool moms as well, because often as a mom, you have, I had five kids and they were all home at once, different grade levels, and I'm one mom, and I had to teach them all the same lesson all at the same time. So I started using this with history and science because it was easier to teach all the kids what they needed to know and be on the same theme at the same time. So this works with religion as well. Um, many people ask me how it is that we have, I was able to convince so many volunteers to come forward and share their time and their talents with those in need. And the answer, I, I'm sorry, I know you're looking for something monumental, but it's just because I asked. That's it, I asked and I received, and that was that's it, God is good. Um, I began the task in faith, and when people saw that I had begun, they were eager to jump on and help me. Um, many tell me that they were excited to share their passion, but they had never been asked to do so before. They didn't have a forum in which to do it. So to be honest, I simply asked. But you know, Father Ed did ask me if I would outline why I think my ministry was so successful. And when I really sat and thought about it, I came up with six points that I think were really helpful to me. And so I'm gonna list them. My first, believe it or not, was desperation. <laughs> I had five children and God expected me to impress upon them that rightful place in his kingdom. And I needed to be sure I did it to the best of my ability. And because I knew they would be the next generation of the, the, the church, it was very important. Um, I saw no wax stains on their shoes. You know, there were no smells, no bells, nothing they needed. No, I was desperate for resources to make those sensory memories. And so I did the best I could and they made them myself. I'm a mom who takes seriously the fact that we live in a war zone that is our modern society. Parents witnessed this assault on God in our schools. Um, 
neighborhoods, even within our own families. Our children have no heroes, and they have very few examples of holiness, and they face a constant temptation to be like the rest of the world. So we parents battle daily to protect the souls of our little ones, and we fight even harder as they grow older. And we don't underestimate or dismiss the ferocity of our enemy. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You all know that. It may sound trite, but to be really honest, I truly do rely apologetic, unapologetically, seriously, and heavily on God, his protection, and his direction. Now, the second reason for my ministry, having been so blessed, is that I'm really extremely dedicated to this mission. My free resources are, are, accept, are accessible 24-7 on the internet worldwide, and I update my social media daily, and I answer all inquiries promptly. My Facebook page proudly says typically replies in an hour, and I really love that. I'm very proud of that, because that, that promptness assures my followers of their importance and my respect. I have to say that when I first began to share my work with others in this digital magazine format, I wanted to include the churches that were working with us within, as my friends on this list. I wanted to share everything I had with them. And I reached out to every single church of all FRKs, of all rights, just as like an email to, to try to, to share. Sadly, half of the, the churches that I tried to contact had no website, or they had no contact information on their website. I was really dismayed by that. Now, many did, and many were open, and they were happy to have it, and I'm not, you know, it, it, it just makes sense to me to be that connected, to be that available. We heard that in so many of the talks today, and so many of your churches are wonderful in that regard. I must admit, I'm very jealous, because I live in an area of the country where that's just not the case all the time. Um, <coughs> number three, I, I make important sensory connections. As I mentioned, my lessons appeal to the senses and they solidify memories. People will not do what they don't understand. And the Busy Kids team works really hard to establish, re-establish those long lost cultural traditions, explaining carefully the why behind the what. Now, I agree wholeheartedly with the theme of this year's assembly when I say we need to treasure our heritage. And so much, we, have to, we need to treasure it so much that nothing will stand in the way of even the littlest traditions, carrying out those littlest things for our children to see, to make connections to God and make us who we are and who our people have been for centuries. We owe that to the Byzantine Catholics who have been before us, and we owe it to our children to connect them to them. We owe this opportunity to follow them to our children. We need them to see all the services. We need them to see all the sights, hear all the bells, the smells, do all the prostrations, which leads me to an aside. I have to tell you a story. When I was teaching at that big church we talked about, um, that catechism program really developed into something wonderful, and it was a great thing for a good long time. We had a Ukrainian seminarian who came to study at a university in our town, and he was staying at the rectory for a while until he could find a place. And he came to church with us all the time. He um, was teaching ECF with us. And one pre-sanctified liturgy, he was there. Next Sunday, we had, had class, and he stopped us all as we were leaving, all of us teachers, and he said something was bothering him and he really needed to share it with us. So we met, he was actually shaking when he said to us that he had been baptized secretly by his grandmother so that his family would not know that he had been baptized and it would put them in danger with the authorities. He said he attended divine liturgy regularly in the forest so as not to be discovered by the government to be a Christian, and that during Lent, they would do prostrations, kneeling in the snow and putting their bare faces to the ground. He said he was shocked when he visited our parish, and the time came to do the prostrations, and here where we were comfortable and free, none of us left our seats to do that. Now, I'm sorry, I, I cried over that, I really did, because I was ashamed. I was an adult, and I went to a church where I thought everything was wonderful, and they taught us so many things, but nobody told me, and I know me, I, I, no one told me that I could get out of my seat and prostrate on the ground in front of my Lord like that. I wish I'd known that. But somewhere, somewhere along the line, that ball was dropped. For whatever reason, I don't know, and I didn't know it. And now, at that moment, all of us teachers at that point made a promise to God that we would never let that happen again, that we would come out and do what we needed to do with our children and teach them better. So anyway, um, back to my list. Next, 
point, I think, that, that helps me along with this ministry is positivity. Um, at Busy Kids, we insist on creating a positive, inclusive, and welcoming atmosphere for all Eastern Christians, especially encompassing the traditions of all the rites and jurisdictions of the Eastern Christian Church. Now, on my team, I have Ruthenians, Melkites, Ukrainians, a Romanian, an Antiochian Orthodox, and two OCA moms. Now, we all work together, and we focus on what we have in common rather than worry about what we have that might keep us apart. We share all our resources with our respective churches, and so far they accept them without hesitation. Um, by working together in this way, we believe we're doing our part to fulfill Christ's dying wish that we all be one in him. Some say that can't be done, but to be honest, now for six years we've done it, and it works. Um, number five, openness to the ideas of others and offering encouragement to those who want to share their gifts and talents. One of the things people say about when they look at my website, is it's a bit like a Greek menu. <laughs> and like, you know, it's all over the place. I have a little bit of this, a little bit of that, all these sub things that you can, you can get lost on the website if you really wanted to. But one of the reasons for that is that um, I'm always willing to help provide a platform for people who have ideas and don't know what to do with them. For instance, one woman came to me and she said, I really have this thing on my heart to pray for priests and I don't know how to do that. Will you help me understand how I can do this so that I could, I could do something similar to what you have but for this particular devotion? And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I already have a website. How about if I give you a page on that site and I'll talk you through what to do? And so we called it Busy Moms for Busy Priests. And it started out just she and I. I created the page. I set up a social media platform that, on Facebook and Instagram for that page. And it's taken off. And now we have 200 devoted souls who pray for priests and religious every single day. So all she needed was a place to start. Um, God took care of the rest. So the sixth thing, the last and final thing that has, in my estimation, been the most important reason for success that God granted to this ministry um, is something I feel a little bit of hesitation mentioning, yet I really feel to compel to share it with you that it, it might inspire others. Now, when it looked as though my days of service to the body of Christ as a catechist were coming to an end, I'm ashamed, but I stopped. I just stopped. I didn't do anything. I went to church. That's all I did because I was hurt. I was angry. I didn't know what to do. I was frustrated. And I'm a little bit ashamed to say that I withdrew from any and all parish activity for quite some time. No one came looking for me either. So ask yourself, now how many people do you know who feel that way? I put all this love that I had for teaching and sharing the good news that God had placed within my heart in a little box on the shelf somewhere, and I waited for someone to come looking for it. I waited for the opportunity to arise again that I could minister to the body of Christ the way that I loved so much. I waited, and I waited, and I waited even longer, and um, when I finally realized that no one was going to come and ask, I decided I had two choices. I could either just let those things sit there. Um, not offer anything to the body of Christ. And then when I got to God at the end of my life, I could say, well, I was afraid to try, Lord. So I hid my talents, and now there they are. Something rang in my mind about that. I'd heard that somewhere before. <laughs> Realized that was not a good idea. And so I decided the alternative would be better. So I gathered the courage that I had, and I stepped out on my own, and I decided to dare to try something new. I chose to take a chance. So one day, almost on a whim, I set up that website and I began posting my reflections in a coffee hour page. I posted a, uh, advice and encouragement for undertaking the, the fast on my great fast meals page. I have a very strong devotion to fasting. That's something I believe in and I promote as well. Um, it's near and dear to my heart. So I began to put things there on that page. And then I began to add lessons and crafts and activities, recipes, games on the Busy Kids page. And I got so carried away <coughs> that I posted all sorts of resources and some that I didn't even realize I had. And when I had so much fun doing that, I just decided to keep on going. Um, gradually, I created social media platforms so that I could connect with people of similar spiritual mindset and then it, I just hit send. And I held my back. Um, there was no going back. I put them out there for everyone and anyone to see. Was I afraid? Oh, yeah. Um, I wonder what people might think I was trying to do. After all, I'm not a theologian, I'm not a teacher, for heaven's sakes, I'm a medical technologist and I worked in a hospital laboratory doing cross-matching, hematology, and blood banking. That's my job. 
<laughs> what do I do? Well, how do I deserve to talk about God? Well, I had to ask myself that, and I wondered what people would think of that. Then I started to think a bit, and I realized I am a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. I am. And I had a very strong desire to uphold that and promote his teachings. I am a cradle Byzantine Catholic who loves our heritage, and I want to see it prosper. I am first and foremost the mother of the next generation of the church. And I want the best, most exciting, most compelling religious education for my children and my grandchildren. And I know for certain that's my best credential. I'd also like to mention that I'm working very closely with Mother Maria in establishing a new lay community, the Burberry Lay Sisters of St. John the Beloved at Holy Annunciation Monastery in Sugarloaf. Um, this is a fledgling lay community. It's presently composed of 25 women who are mothers, grandmothers, businesswomen from all walks of Eastern Christian Catholicism everywhere, all over the United States. We pattern ourselves after the Holy Mer Bears, who early in the morning before sunrise, as if it were all dirty day, were out in the darkness and cold, carrying their little individual jars of myrrh to anoint the body of Christ in anticipation of his eventual rising to renew glory. So we're renewed to the concept, or I'm sorry, we're devoted to the concept of offering our own personal myrrh, our gifts and our talents to the body of Christ, which is the church. This endeavor of mine is my myrrh. Now, as the coordinator of the Burberry Lay Sisters, I help other Byzantine women discover their own myrrh, their own given gifts and talents. And we call these little gifts and individual ministries our obedience. And we pledge to take them on and offer them for the sake of the entire church as modern versions of the Burberry women who are our patrons. So let me ask you, what's your myrrh? Do you know? Have you thought about it? I believe we all have myrrh to bring to Christ. And I encourage those who are excited about their Byzantine Catholic faith to step out into the darkness with us and share whatever you can with others in joyful anticipation of the rising of the body of Christ our church in renewed glory that's inevitably to come. So the message I want to convey to you today is this. Do not underestimate the power of God to speak to and through anyone, even the most humble. Do not let anyone tell you you have nothing to give to the body of Christ. Find your myrrh and step out into the darkness. Don't wait for someone else to ask you to step up and serve. Take that first step. God will take care of the rest. Thank you very much for allowing me to tell my story today. God bless you.